Chapter 10, Respiration and Artificial Ventilation. This chapter we're going to start talking about how we keep a person alive with some additional resources to uh, help them breathe and how we determine what level of assistance is needed. First we need to review the physiology and pathophysiology and how we breathe. Just as a reminder, ventilation is a process of moving air in and out. Air goes in, inhalation, exhalation, inspiration, expiration, several different terms for the same thing, but it's air going in and out. Inhalation or, or inspiration, the chest muscles expand, the diaphragm contracts, dropping it down into the abdominal cavity, making the chest bigger. Bigger ca cavity creates a little negative, a lower pressure. The lower pressure creates a need to equalize pressure and pull the air in. Exhalation, everything relaxes and the chest wall gets smaller. Small cavity means increased pressure and the air tries to equalize by going out. So we've already talked about uh, tidal volume, the amount of air going in and out in one breath. Minute volume is how much goes in over the whole minute. We're going to use that to determine the adequacy of breathing based on our uh, knowledge of how normal the body right, likes to have homeostasis in the same numbers all the time by changing other factors in the minute volume to try to compensate. Ventilation is where the gas exchange occurs in the alveoli level. So you've got ventilation into the bloodstream and then you've also got ventilation into the cells. So let's talk about the alveolar uh, ventilation first. <clears throat> when you breathe in, a portion of the air makes it to the alveoli level, the rest is ha hanging out in the dead space, so there's not a gas exchange of that. So we've got extra air in there that hasn't been uh, depleted of oxygen or filled with carbon dioxide. The alveoli, alveoli forms the end of the bronchial tubes, the sacs inflate and decrease in size based on the inhalation expiration. All the capillaries surrounding those uh, alveoli had the gas exchange, and that's how we have respiration into the vascular system. The way the air moves is called diffusion. So we take it from a con concentration of higher, or an area of higher concentration to an area of lower concentration. So the air in the lungs has 21% oxygen. The, the blood cells have zero because they've dropped off all the oxygen. So it's going to move from the 21 to the uh, zero. It's opposite's going to be happening on the uh, CO2. You're going to higher concentration in the blood than you do in the lungs, so it's going to move that direction. Same thing happens to uh, the at the cellular level. When you get the oxygen to the cell, cell level through the red blood cells, it transfers over to the cells based on the same diffusion principles. To make everything work right, you have to have a good respiratory system and a good cardiovascular system. So if one of the two doesn't work correct, we've got a VQ mismatch. That's when we have a sick patient. First thing we're going to look at are the mechanical failures that could happen to the cardiopulmonary system. Uh, something changes the ability of the chest to expand and contract. Uh, maybe there's a hole in the chest from a stab wound or a uh, gunshot wound that causes the negative pressure to not function correctly. If it, the air will move in the path of least resistance and if there's a hole going into the pleural cavity, it won't go into the lung tissue. You could lose uh, nervous system control over the muscles that uh, make the chest expand and contract. C3, 4, and 5 have the nerves that go off and keep the diaphragm alive. Uh, so that's uh, where our, our nerve endings come out to cause contraction of the diaphragm. You could have a painful chest wall injury. If you ever had a broken rib, you can fully understand this one. It's hard to take a deep breath. Uh, if you ever see anybody that has a any type of thoracotomy, uh, open heart surgery, they're going to have a, pa a difficulty taking a deep breath. You can also have uh, constrictive problems inside the chest with bronchial constriction from like asthma or bronchitis or pneumonia or uh, that's one of the things that COVID causes is a bronchial constriction. 
You could have an interruption of the gas exchange. Maybe you don't have enough oxygen in the outside air. As uh, normally you have 19.5 to 21.5 or 22.5. Maybe you got a low oxygen content. Yeah, there's uh, you're in a confined space or an area that someone's pushed the oxygen out of with other chemicals. Uh, you could have problems with the diffusion across the alveoli ba barriers. This could be from mucus buildup. It could be from uh, some type of chemical damage to the lungs. So there's there's all kinds of opportunities to uh, inhibit the oxygen and carbon dioxide transfer at the alveoli level. If we don't have enough blood, you don't have the ability to push the uh, the blood through the body. So you'll have decreased perfusion at the uh, cellular level. You could also have a loss of hemoglobin or a damage to the hemoglobin. You could have some type of anemia. Uh, you could have some uh, other diseases that cause increased clotting in the bloodstream and cause a decrease in your hemoglobin. Or the hemoglobin could be saturated with carbon monoxide, which doesn't like to let go. It, it grabs onto a red blood cell and hangs on as tight as it can. And it prohibits that... Uh, red blood cell from picking out of any oxygen in the future. So let's talk about respirations. Your brain needs oxygen to live. We breathe because we have hypoxia or a low level of oxygen or uh, hypercapnia which is a high level of carbon dioxide. What we want to do is assess our patients and make sure that they are getting good ventilations and respirations so that we get rid of the carbon dioxide and pick up plenty of oxygen so we get out of that hypoxic hypercapnic state. When the cardiopulmonary system fails, we try to compensate. If the chemoreceptors pick up that your, your body is getting hypercapnic, you're going to start breathing faster you're going to start your heart rate beating faster and your blood vessels are going to constrict and bring your blood pressure up higher. This is all efforts the body's going to do to try to get better perfusion to the end organs. Our goal here is to find out what's causing this to happen and fix it so the body can relax again and uh, go back to normal homeostasis. Respiratory distress is when the compensation is working. They're going to have normal look to them, normal mental status, normal color, pulse ox is normal, but something is not right. Their body is compensating, but we need to figure out why they're compensating, what's causing them to work extra. If they don't, they can't compensate or they're trying to compensate and it's not working, that's when we consider it respiratory failure. Their skin is starting to turn cyanotic, their mental status is changing, they're having poor perfusion at the end organs. Eventually, it prog uh, progresses to respiratory arrest when they stop breathing altogether, and that's when we, we that's where we don't want to go with our patients. We'd really like to catch them in respiratory distress, find out what's causing the distress, and fix it right then. If they're in failure, then we've got to work for them and help them breathe. And if they're in arrest, they we just take over for them completely. Sometimes the uh, breathing's inadequate; it makes it too hard to breathe. So their rate of breathing, the depth of breathing, or both fail outside of normal ranges. So that's where we start looking at our patients on a regular basis and looking to see how people breathe normally. Most of the time you can walk up and look at a person to see if they're breathing normal. All right, the first step when we walk up to any patient is determine if they're breathing. Talk to them, say, hi, I'm Ken and I'm EMT. What's your name? If they can answer you, they're breathing. If you can speak, you're breathing. So we want to make sure that's one of our first pieces there. Next is, are they breathing adequate? Look, are, do, they, do we see the chest rise and fall? Do we see air going in and out of the mouth and hear the air going in and out? Is the skin normal, uh, normal color? Rate rhythm quality, is it normal? Normal is 18 or 12 to 12 to 20 on breathing for adults, a little faster for kids, but you'll get the you'll get an idea of what that should look like. Signs of inadequate breathing, 
they've got an altered mental status. It might be as subtle as they're uh, a little anxious. They're a little irritable. So you've got to determine quickly whether they're irritable on the purpose of, or the, the reason that they're irritable is because of what the reason they called you or they're irritable because they're hypoxic. You don't see good movement in the chest or it's uneven. One side's going up and the other way's not. Uh, the pulse is too slow in kids. That's one of the first things they pick up is uh, if they're starting to have difficulty breathing, their pulse slows down because their heart needs that extra oxygen. You see the belly moving up and down. You see the uh, muscles around the clavicles moving in and out. You don't hear any uh, air going in and out of the mouth. Or you hear abnormal sounds, the wheezing, the crowing, the strider, gurgling, gasping. Something's telling you they're working really hard to get air in and out. Breathing's too fast or too slow. Normal's 12 to 20. We get nervous if they're below 8 or above 24. That's when we start thinking, do we need to help that person? Breathing is shallow or very deep. Or they look like they're working really hard to push air in and out. Maybe they've got some type of congestion and they're pushing air as hard as they can to move it through. You start seeing cyanosis or the blue-gray look to the skin. It's mainly around the lips, the tongues, the ears, the nail beds. Maybe they're breathing... A two-second count on inspiration and a one-second expiration. Something's not working right. They can't talk. They can't form a complete sentence. Uh, they can't produce or they can't speak a complete sentence. And we have to determine whether it's their ability to speak or their ability to form a sentence. Um, sometimes it's a mental issue that's causing the uh, inability to form a complete sentence. You see the retractions, you see the uh, pulse ox is less than 95, less than 90 at altitude here. And their body position. Look at how they're sitting. If they're leaning forward, hands on their knees, got the chest kind of arched up, they're trying to open up the chest wall, try to get as deep breath in, that's called tripod positioning. That's a clue that tells you they're having difficulty breathing. Hypoxia, the definition is the uh, insufficient blood supply to the tissue. It could be because they have, they're in an area with decreased oxygen, such as a fire or a, con, a confined space. The fire is actually consuming oxygen faster than the patient can get to it. Or the fire has caused damage to the tissue and they can't uh, get that gas exchange. Could be emphysema or chronic bronchitis. Could be uh, overdose. Something like an opioid that depresses the breathing rate. Or they're having another medical emergency that's causing the problem to get worse. A heart attack. They can't pump the blood. Or they're having a stroke and their body's not sending the signal out correctly. Or even an air, uh, embolism that goes to the lungs and blocks the arteries in the lungs. And then you can't transport the blood back and forth. All potential causes here, and we're, we're trying to look at what's causing it and fix the problem. Almost every patient that has respiratory dif difficulties, you need to put oxygen on. And we're going to talk about how to get that oxygen to them here shortly. If they are not breathing on their own, you do artificial ventilations. If the patient's having difficult, inadequate breathing, you do a non-rebreather. Supplemental oxygen helps the breathing patient. So you have to determine quickly, how much intervention do I need? If they are not able to move air on their own adequately, you have to push it in for them. You breathe for them. If they can breathe, but they just need a little help, you put a non breather on them and let them breathe it in. If for some reason you think they just need a, just a little boost in the content of the oxygen, you can put a nasal cannula. I like this last sentence here. It's better to be too aggressive than not aggressive enough. It's really much easier to explain to your medical director that, oh, I, I went overboard, I did too much, than I didn't do enough and I got to the hospital and realized my blue patient was uh, going to get me fired. So let's talk about positive pressure ventilation. You are pushing air in. You use the force, the, the some positive pressure force to push air into the lungs. They have to be stopped breathing or very inadequate. 
if you try to do this to a conscious patient, they get a little nervous. So we try to – most patients that need it are unconscious. Negative side effects, you can decrease cardiac output and you decrease blood pressure. But if they're not breathing, that decreases it too. So it's 50-50 uh, here. Just give it to them and make sure they stay breathing. Sometimes if we don't get the airway open correctly, the air will go into the stomach and cause gastric distension. The problem here is that when the stomach gets to a certain point of being full, everything in the stomach contents will come out with that extra air. So now you've just created an airway issue for yourself. So be very careful to maintain a good airway, keep a head tilt chin lift, jaw thrust, something to uh, to keep them, uh, keep them from getting that gastric distension. If we do hyperventilation, we breathe faster than every five to six seconds. We can do vasoconstriction because of too much carbon dioxide being taken off. So you're, you're kind of fooling the body thinking that uh, it's breathing normal again and it starts to, uh, starts to relax or it starts to constrict the vascular system. And that's not a good thing when we're hypoxic. We want as much blood flow as we can. So avoid the hyperventilation. This is common when you have a patient in CPR or uh, respiratory distress and you're nervous and you think you're breathing every five to six seconds and you're really breathing every two seconds. So we're going to work, work on that throughout the class here. Three most common methods for giving artificial ventilations. Mouth to mask, two rescuer bag valve mask, and one rescuer bag valve mask. And that is presented in the order of preference. The mouth to mask gives you really good pressure control because you feel exactly how much pressure is going in and out and you can adjust as needed. Two rescuer, you have one person hold the mask on the face so you have two hands holding the mask to the face which gives you a much better seal and the other person uses two hands to squeeze the mat, to squeeze the bag. The least preferred and the most commonly used is one rescuer where you have one person hold the mask with one hand and they hold the bag with the other. It's key to remember here, it's a good point, uh, never ventilate a patient who's vomiting or have vomitus in the airway because that just pushes it down in the lungs. So be careful of that one, keep your suction handy. When you're ventilating the patient, you put, squeeze the bag or you blow into the mask enough to see the chest go up. When the chest goes up, you can release and let the air, chest relax. So you're looking for a chest rise and fall as you're doing the ventilations. You get it too fast, too slow, you're not getting good ventilation if the chest doesn't move, or you don't get a good uh, seal on your mask, you're not getting good ventilations. Uh, if you want to ensure you're not getting around the body fluids, don't do mouth to mouth. Uh, that is something that uh, uh, we used years ago. Mouth to mouth was acceptable, and anymore uh, we've learned that we've got tools to prevent disease transmission, so we're going to use them. Uh, use that barrier device. Use a pocket mask. Carry it in your pocket with you if you're working just in case you get a patient where you think you need to do mouth to mouth. Ventilating a patient who is breathing. Figure out if they're breathing adequately. Tell the patient what you're doing and why you're doing it, and just kind of try to keep them as relaxed, relaxed as you can when you put this mask over their face and say, just breathe normal while I squeeze this air into your lungs. It's not going to be easy, and that's why we, we use the CPAP, which is a better option. Uh, but if you have to breathe for them, you have to, um, and, or you can just wait till they pass out completely. If the va uh, patient is breathing too slowly, tell them what you're doing and you want to breathe every time they take a breath and then maybe once between every other breath. So you're adding it up to get about 12 respirations per minute. Opening the airway, we've learned that one. You head tilt, chin lift, suction. Put the head in this uh, sniffing position. Maybe put some pads where you need them to keep the head in the right position. Uh, put the pads behind the neck put, or pads behind the shoulders. Depends on your patient needs. 
if you've got a patient who is really obese and it's hard to get a good airway on them, you might want to angle them at about a 45 degree angle. That helps kind of align all the airway stuff and you can lean the head back a little bit. If you have suspected spinal injury, try to keep the head neutral while you do the jaw thrust and get the air to go in. You remember you're blowing just enough to get the chest to rise and then fall. If you blow too much, it goes into the gut and you get the gastric distension and eventually a blocked airway. Really important to get a good seal on the mat face. Uh, things that you need to you may need to make sure you have the right size mask. We have pediatric to adult size mask. We have different styles of, styles of masks. So pick the one that works best for you and your patient. Preferred method is two hands, one on either side, pushing the mask. <clears throat> if you push the mask too hard and the patient complains about it, you probably don't need to be ventilating them. So push as hard as you need to. And if you get them to complain, give yourself a high five. Things that make it harder to get a seal. Uh, bushy beards. They got the ZZ Top quality beard going on. Put the water lubricant on it. Get you a good seal going. Uh, if they've got dentures, leave them in place. Try to get the, the teeth to form the foundation for you to put the mask on. Maybe raise the head a little bit. Put an airway adjunct and then grab a team. Use two people to ventilate if you can. Mouth to mask. Use the pocket mask. They're typically uh, uh, nice and solid. You put them on the face. They give you a, a one-way valve which keeps your face off of the, uh, the patient's face and gives you a little protection from the junkies if they do uh, vomit. Uh, most of them have a little port on the side where you can attach the oxygen and increase the oxygen you're blowing in. If you do not have that oxygen port, remember you've got 21% oxygen in the air. When you exhale, you're exhaling 16%, so you're not much below room air, and that still gives you the ability to tra uh, treat a patient. It's better if you have oxygen. One interesting way I saw one time was a volunteer firefighter didn't have the adapter on his mask, but he put a nasal cannula on himself, so when he exhaled, he had more oxygen coming out. I thought it was pretty pretty smart for a, a volunteer firefighter there. So um, if you have the strap on it, put the strap around the head. Keep it in place so you don't have to pick it up every time you stop. This is what a mask looks like. You notice the one-way valve on the top. Up here, there's a valve in here. When they exhale, it comes out the bottom. This one is very important to notice. Nose goes here. And this mask particularly doesn't have a port for your oxygen. That's just a little uh, a nub is for the manufacturer. So if you have a without spinal head injury or spinal injury, you get at the head, you put fingers behind the jaws, you sit your thumbs on your mask, and you pull the face into the mask. And then that gives you a good open airway. This might be a time to drop an OPA to give you even better op uh, airway. So lift it into the mask, squeeze the uh, mask with your thumbs as hard as you can and give a breath through the one-way valve, looking down at the chest to make sure it goes up and down with each breath. Here's an example and you see he's got the oxygen tube hooked up to it. If they, uh, you want to be beside the patient because you don't have enough space, you're going to put one finger and thumb on the bottom and then one on the top, kind of a V shape with your finger and forefinger and use that to kind of hold it in. Highly recommend you practice this way when you uh, get the opportunity in the skill nights. Place the thumb, lift the jaw, squeeze tight and blow. Spinal injury, take the head put it between your knees, hold it tight that way, or you could put your forearms beside the head and use them to hold the mask on and pull the face up into it. Lift at the angle of the jaw, but don't tilt the head. Squeeze and breathe. BVMs, take it to the next level here. Bag valve mask gives you the ability to breathe for non-breathing patients. 
you get a much better protection from infection to infection control and they come in multiple sizes you have adult child and infant use the right size for the right patient sometimes we're going to use a different size mask on a smaller face but we're going to use the right size bag so get used to using the one that's appropriate for your patient a lot of them have the extra bag for oxygen on the very end that's going to help you uh, make sure you're giving 100 percent oxygen to your patient this shows the three sizes of bags we carry uh, you notice you've got the the adult on the top child on the middle and infant on the bottom the infant's lungs are so small we're very careful there so you just give a little puff and it goes up based on the size of your patient you've got the oxygen attached to the BVM it enters the reservoir when you squeeze the bag it pushes the air that's inside of the bag into the lungs delivering that 100% oxygen in and then when you release the pressure it sucks the air from the oxygen the the, the thinner bag on the end into the bag that's being squeezed for your patient when you exhale it goes out through the uh, side ports through the bat the valve so two person with no spinal head in this elevated position pick the right one kneel next to the head two thumbs along the side of the mask the bridge or the triangle over the bridge of the nose and put the mask on there is not really a right or wrong as long as you get the nose over the nose and you push down hard uh, we will practice with our mannequins you'll get the pre uh, you'll get the procedure down fairly good and then every patient's going to be just a little different so be willing to adjust as needed use the index finger and the ring fingers and pull the jaw up into the mask maintain it and then you have the second person squeeze the bag so that's two persons if they've got a spinal injury you might even use three I like to just put a knee on either side of the head of the patient use my finger or my knees to stabilize the head and my hands to lift the jaw into my mask without changing the angle of the neck kind of example here there you see the fingers behind the jaw pulling the jaw up into the mask and that gives you a good seal and without moving the head around so one rescuer gets a little bit more complicated you've got to be able to squeeze the mask put your forefinger and your thumb around the 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 tube that connects the mask to the BVM and hold it and then take your other three fingers and grab the jaw and pull them up into the the mask so it takes a little practice but with practice you'll get much better once you're confident you've got a good seal use your other hand to squeeze the bag and try to squeeze as much air out as possible to get the chest to rise if you don't get a good chest rise or you can't get a good squeeze on it use your thigh and put the bag up against your thigh and push it between your thigh and your hand that gives you a little bit more leverage when you're trying to push if the chest does not go up and down check the mask check the head position do you need to tilt the head back further if you are trying to protect the airway and you can't get the airway or excuse me you're trying to protect the neck from for potential spinal injury and you can't get the airway open it's going to be a quick decision to reposition the head and try to get an airway it doesn't matter if you protect the spine if your patient doesn't breathe you might want to check for airway obstructions is there anything in there that's uh, causing problems for you or check your equipment maybe switch to a pocket mask until you get a good BVM that's why I always like to carry one in my pocket just in case so I don't have to do mouth to mouth but I've got an alternate uh, way to give breathing if I have to when we're doing ventilations during CPR we kind of coordinate that with the chest compressions if you're doing one or two person CPR you've got actually you'd be doing two person if you got a BVM going so you would do uh, 30 to 2 so one breath every 30 or two breaths every 30 compressions once we get an advanced airway in 
one of our uh, supercolitic airwaves or an endotracheal tube from the paramedics, then we can go to one breath every five to six seconds and just try to mix it between the uh, compressions. You don't have to wait. So if you have a stoma, a stoma is a cut in the hole, a hole in the neck goes right into the trachea. Sometimes these are complete stomas. So that there is no air that goes out through the mouth. These are people that typically cannot talk. And so they put that hole in there. Some of them have a partial uh, stoma. So if they plug the hole, the air will go through their vocal cords and out their mouth. So you need to quickly figure this one out. Because if it's a partial and you put the mask over the stoma, it's going to blow it out the, the mouth, which is the path of least resistance. You can also plug the stoma and try to breathe through the mouth and nose. So there's some options there. Keep the head neutral. Use a pediatric mask because it's going to fit over the stoma. And then the other thing to remember when you're ventilating is that you now do not have to fill up the mouth, and the nasal pharynx, and the oral pharynx. You just have to ventilate straight from the trachea into the lungs. So again, watch the chest rise and fall, and it's going to be a lot quicker than if you uh, had to go through the mouth. If you're breathing too fast, you're going to hyperventilate, hyperventilate your patient and cause vasoconstriction. Too slow, and your hypoventilation hypoxia. One of the, the um, a device they made several years ago uh, was called a rescue pod. It actually provided back pressure when the patient was exhaling for ventilations that was similar to what you would get with a CPAP but during artificial ventilations. Turned out it didn't provide much uh, change in your patient outcomes so we got rid of it. But the one thing on it that was really awesome that they should somebody needs to develop, it had a little blinky light on it that every six seconds it blinked and told you it's time to ventilate. So that, that get made it much easier for you if you're trying to do ventilations, you just look for the blinky light. With adults, it's 12 to 10 to 12 times a minute, so once every six to five to six seconds. On a child, it's every five to or uh, every three to five seconds. So be aware of the differences there. You're a little bit faster on the kid. Be careful when you're ventilating that you don't squeeze too much or too fast. If you get too much volume, it can actually damage the lung tissue or it could cause gastric distension. So it's a nice, smooth, gentle squeeze delivered over a second and you watch till the chest moves. Don't wait till the chest is full. We just need movement. We sometimes have our automatic transport ventilators. You hook them up, set them to the rate you want, and they will go on their own. Every system has their choice on what they use, so know what's used in your system. I don't think we have any in our system right now, but uh, based on your protocols, use what you need. This is a picture of what one looks like. You see you can change it from adult to child. The title volume you're looking for and the uh, respirations per minute. All right, let's talk about oxygen therapy. We all agree that oxygen is important. You need it to, to live. So things you got to remember, oxygen is a drug. You can give too much or too little. We can actually cause harm by giving too much oxygen, so we got to be careful with it. It is in our protocols. It's one of those standing orders that you can give if you think the patient needs it. Oxygen can cause problems for us if the patient has a heart attack or stroke. So we've got to be very careful to assess the needs of the patient for oxygen if they're in one of these conditions that could cause harm. So think about it based on where you are. Uh, do they need that extra oxygen or not? And if you do, give it. If you don't need it, hold it back a little bit. That's when the patient's having chest pain, their O2 sats are 90s, upper 90s. They don't need any extra oxygen. If they're in the 80s, they need oxygen. So use a little professional judgment here. And pretty much every cardiac arrest patient is going to need oxygen. They're in that position where they're uh, they're sick enough that anything's going to help. 
things we're looking for in our oxygen equipment. It has to be safe and lightweight, portable, dependable. We've looked at our O2 tanks. We've looked at our regulators. We know what we've got. There, it's We've got a good system set up. They have to be able to attach to your uh, BBMs and your pocket mask, so we have those connecting tubes, and we have to have the right equipment to take care of the patients of the various sizes. The cylinders, oxygen tanks, are usually steel or aluminum alloy. Uh, they're most of the ones anymore are alloys, so they're a little bit easier, lighter. A D cylinder, that's what typically is found in our O2 tanks or our bags. That's 350 liters of oxygen. An E tank is the bigger ones that we have in our uh, we have access to. They're 625. Then the M tank is what you would actually have in an ambulance. That's a 3,000 liter oxygen tube. Uh, the G's and the H's are more what you would have in uh, long-term care facilities or in hospitals. They're almost always, they're, uh, medical grade oxygen is green or green with white. That's your only options here. That's the M tank. That's the one that's in the ambulance. That one's on a nice uh, hydraulic system to take it in and out for you. If you don't have that, get lots of help. They are heavy and they're awkward. There's no handles on them. It's hard to move in and out. But uh, that most of modern ambulances have these uh, these uh, cysts on them to move for you. Always use pressure gauges that are supposed to be used for it. Don't use your welding uh, oxygen. Not good. Use uh, wrenches that aren't going to spark. We don't want to create a spark that's going to catch something on fire for us. Gaskets have to be good. Don't use your welding oxygen. We've said that. And always open the valve fully and then turn it back. That way you can ex you know it's uh, it's on. You can move the valve a little bit either way. Keep them cool and ventilated and secured. Do not leave them standing upright. We do not want them falling over and breaking the stem off and causing more problems for us. They have to be checked every five years for integrity, so your service should take care of that for you. Uh, but if you see one that the hydrostatic testing is marked as uh, over five years, take it out of service. If you drop it or damage it, take it out of service and ask them to test it again. And no smoking around oxygen equipment. It doesn't cause an explosion, but it's going to make the fire burn really hard. Uh, don't use any grease, oil, or fat-based soaps. They can uh, catch fire real easy with the oxygen content there. Uh, do not use adhesive tape on the cylinder. That's just It causes more problems than it's worth. And don't drag it. I took over a EMT class one time for another instructor, and he had taught them to take the head of the backboard lift it and put the round oxygen tank underneath the head and that way there was much easier to put the tape on the forehead of your patient so now you've got a patient laying on a round cylinder full of compressed gases as you try to protect their spine so probably not a good idea the lower one is the d tank the top one is the e tank those are the ones we mainly use in ems Pressure regulator has to be in there. The uh, right now, when you just start it up, you have 2,500 psi, and you need to get down to 30 to 70 so you get uh, a good working pressure for your uh, oxygen to go into your patient. Flow meters control how much. So that's that one we saw, 0.25 to 25 liters per minute. Make sure you say liters per minute because it, that's what it is. It's not milliliters. Uh, we have two different flow meters. The ones we use on the ambulance are the uh, pressure compensated flow meters. They're the ones that, uh, and the constant flow selector is the ones we use on their bags that we take out of the amp. Here's kind of a, a little description of both of them. The one that's the green block is what you'll see in the ambulance or in the hospital. There's a little ball that uh, goes up, and you use that to gauge how fast 
how much oxygen you're putting through. The one on the right is typically the one in, we have in our bags, and you just dial up what you need. This extra port here, that's where you would hook in your CPAP, or you would hook in your uh, demand valve, and we'll talk what those are. This little nipple here is where we hook the oxygen tubing itself. Sometimes we use humidifiers. If you're in an area that uh, has really dry air, like Colorado, a humidifier is a good thing. Uh, you put that onto your oxygen ta uh, regulator in the ambulance. It gives you a, a little bubbling action, and you get humidity within the oxygen you're giving your patient. Long-term care uh, patients that are in the hospital, they like to humidify it. If we have a patient that is hyperthermic or hypothermic, we can help change their body temperature by giving them uh, humidified oxygen that's either cooled or heated, depending on the need. So that's something else uh, that's a little bit uh, good to know. Here's a picture of what they look like. It just attaches to the bottom of your regulator. Typically, non -dis uh, long distance transfers, you'll have these. Uh, routine transports, we're not, we don't see them long enough to uh, benefit. If you have the right equipment, you have everything uh, tested and checked appropriately, you shouldn't have any problems. If the valve stem breaks off, it can float down the, uh, the road through the wall of the ambulance. Uh, lots of problems there. Oxygen makes things burn faster. So if you get a fire and you attach oxygen to it, it's going to be hotter and faster. So that's a, that's a problem for us. And if you use oil, it explodes. So that's just a bad thing. So use precaution. Be safe around your oxygen. If you have a patient who has a hypoxic drive, you can create an overload of oxygen by giving too much too soon. It usually takes 24 to 48 hours. So you're okay with that one. Uh, if you have premature infants, and you have a long period of exposure to oxygen, they could go blind. Uh, if you have a long period of exposure to any patient, you need to learn how to drive to the hospital. You're lost. Uh, you shouldn't have a patient more than an hour anywhere in Colorado. Unless it's a long distance transfer, then they will adjust for these. They'll have nurses that tell you what you can and can't do. Underlying medical conditions can be exacerbated. exacerbated. So if you've got myocardial infarction or strokes, we need to be conscious of the, the needs of the patient, whether they need oxygen or not, and make those critical decisions at the time. We're going to go over all the different types of oxygen administration tools uh, in class. We'll, we'll pick those up and we'll play with them and learn how to use the different ones. So we'll, we'll go with that as we need to. Thinking about a patient with chest pain, we're going to want to uh, make sure they really need the oxygen before we give it to them. So it might just be a nasal cannula. This is the little nose in the hose to give them a little uh, two to four liters, just enough to perk them up a little bit, but not really uh, going to cause more problems. If they really do need oxygen, they're in severe distress and their low pulse ox is low, we're going to give them oxygen by a non breather. We want to make sure they get what they need. But always follow your local protocols. Non-rebreather mask is the best way to give oxygen. If you we, really patient really needs oxygen, they have to be breathing on their own. They have to be uh, able to move the air in and out at a normal rate. If they're breathing too fast or too slow, this is not going to help them. You need to do the more aggressive bag valve mask. But if they're breathing normal, but they just need a lot of oxygen, you give this to them. So it has to be put on the face with the seal around the nose. You pinch the nose on the mask, and it gives you a good uh, seal there. You give them 15 liters a minute. It fills up that little reservoir bag, and you're given 80 to 90% oxygen with it. So it's a real good device to get plenty of oxygen. When you exhale, it goes through a little flutter valve on the side, uh, and then... 
it also has a little extra valve if the oxygen goes out, but you're not going to let that happen because your quality EMTs are going to be watching your patient all the time if you have to do this. So patients that get this are the ones with hypoxia from shortness of breath, chest pain, or altered mental status. They really need oxygen. You're going to give them oxygen. That's what it looks like. That little tab on the nose squeezes down, gives you a nice tight th uh, seal. You've got the elastic strap straps that go around the head, and you pull that out. So it's nice and tight, and you let them breathe through it. It's notice it's clear so that you can see everything that's going on around the mouth. If they vomit, you can take it off. Note the little disc on the side; those are the flutter valves. So when they exhale, it goes out and doesn't. They don't have to rebreathe it. Nasal cannula gives you around 24 to 44 percent oxygen. Normal air is 21 percent, so we're just a little bit higher. Put the little prongs in the nose. They don't go over the, the forehead or the bridge of the nose like you see the uh, people in Walmart doing. You take the tubing, wrap it around the ears, and come back underneath the chin with a little slip nut, and that's how you get it to stay on. Do not put uh, more than four liters on these. You can go up to six, but four is a good maximum to keep in mind. Uh, it could, you can also use these for patients that just don't tolerate a mask. They're not breathing well, but they won't put a mask on. It's causing more anxiety, and that causes more difficulty breathing, so we're going to just put a nasal cannula on. Here's what a cannula looks like. The two prongs go in the nose, and then that goes around the ears, and they are secured. Partial rebreather. It's kind of like a non-rebreather, but it has a one-way valve. Or doesn't have the one-way valve, so they can breathe back and forth a little bit easier. Uh, these are typically 40 to 60 percent when you put it 9 to 10 liters per minute. This is not uh, one that we carry in our system, but if your system has that, be familiar with them. A venturi mass. This one's a little bit uh, more common. It you you hook it to the oxygen, and then you have an adapter dial on it that you can tell exactly what percentage mix you want the patient to get. So if you want them to get 28%, 42%, you dial it on the, the, the airway device, and it gives the patient exactly what you want. It's common we use these for uh, COPD, chronic bronchitis, emphysema patients, because we want them to have a very specific oxygen content if we're going to be doing long transport. This is what a Venturi mask looks like. You see on the bottom, it's got that little dial where you can pick how much oxygen you're given. Works really good. Again, that's the, the little closer look there. The trach mask. If they are breathing and they uh, don't need ventilations, we're going to give them a trache uh, tracheostomy mask. It's a, like an ox oxygen mask for just the neck. What it looks like there just sits right over the top of it, hooks the oxygen, and they can breathe much better. All right, high concentration oxygen if they're in respiratory distress, give them oxygen. If it's an infant or child, they can't uh, tolerate the face, the mask over the face, you can just take the tube and stick it in their face and fill the whole air around their face. Or hold the mask a couple inches away from it. That's a great job to give a parent to help help them help their kid and keep them focused. You could also, they, they've got a little device that looks like a teddy bear that has an oxygen port on the bat. So you put this, you hook the oxygen to it, turn it on to 15 liters. Put it in front of the face and they go goo goo gaga -ga because of the little teddy bear. But they're getting oxygen so you're doing two jobs. All right, let's talk about some special considerations we're going to run into with oxygen. Facial injuries that need suctioning. Try to secure the airway the best you can. Put the adjunct in. Put the endotracheal tube in with the paramedics. Something to keep the airway secured. And then suction all the extra fluid that's going around. If there's obstructions, you got to get that out. Maybe abdominal thrust, chest thrust, finger sweeps. Get the paramedics involved, get ALS there, use the uh, McGill forceps, something to get that device, whatever's blocking the airway. Dentures, preferred to leave them in place. If they become a hazard, take them out. 
if family members share them, take them out so the other family members have, can eat that night. Kids, their tongues are huge, so we need to be careful about how we drop the OPA. Some of you noticed in our airway bags there was a tongue depressor along with the o uh, OPAs. What we do with that is we can actually push the tongue down and slip the airway in right over the top of it and then release it and the airway, uh, the tongue falls on top of the airway in the back of the throat. The other thing we need to be aware of is the trachea is very flexible and if you bend it incorrectly, you can actually kink it like a straw. So we want to make sure we keep the head in a neutral position and that we watch how they're breathing as we're doing it. If the chest doesn't rise, there's an option for you to adjust the head a little bit. The other thing to remember about kiddos is they burn oxygen really fast, about twice the rate as the adults. So they're going to need a lot more oxygen. That's why if you've got two rescuers CPR on a child, you're doing 15 to 2 instead of the 30 to 2. So you're trying to get more oxygen in there. Excessive pressures can cause more problems. You can actually blow out the lungs of a kiddo. So it's real important to make sure we use the uh, the right size back valve mask. We write right size pressures. Flow restriction oxygen powered ventilatory devices. These uh, are also called demand valves. They hook right onto that larger port on the side of the uh, O2 regulators and give you a very high pressure ventilation. They could be used in place of a back valve mask, but if you use them on a kiddo, they've got way too much pressure, so they're not. The, we don't use them on kiddos. Actually, our systems here don't use them at all, but they're more common in areas that have uh, uh, a lot of drownings. They're really good for drowning victims. So you see them in coastal communities and areas that have lots of pools like uh, Phoenix or Las Vegas. Use the right size mask on the right size person and be aware of gastric distension. All right, here's the part where you get to help your paramedics look good. EMTs, or paramedics save lives, EMTs save their paramedics. So make your paramedic look good, stroke their ego, do what you can to get them the, where they are, but don't be afraid to call them on stuff if they're taking too long or uh, you think they're not doing things right. Ask them, hey, are you sure that's the right option? Or how come you're taking 15 seconds when you told me only stop 10 seconds for CPR? So when the patient, when the paramedic's going to put the advanced airway in, they're going to want to put the patient in a sniffing position. So they tilt the head back, put the nose straight up. They're going to ask you to make sure the patient's got extra oxygen just so they have a few extra seconds to get the tube in correctly. They'll drop, they'll pull out the OPA, drop an endotracheal tube in place. And then they may ask you to burp the patient. What they're asking is for you to grab the cricoid membrane or cricoid cartilage. It's the uh, ring at the very top of the trachea and it's right by the uh, larynx. And if you kind of move that for them, they can get to the right place to do the endotracheal tube really easy. That shows the uh, pressure thumb on the finger on the side of the trachea and you move it upwards and to the right. That way you give the uh, paramedic a little bit more room there. And we'll practice this. Uh, you, we'll uh, get the mannequins out and you can, can see what happens when we try to intubate and uh, go from there. Once the tube is in place, a good paramedic is not going to let go of that tube. So with one hand, the paramedic's going to hold the tube in place and put a finger on the chin so no matter what happens it doesn't move because they want to confirm that it's in the right place even though they saw it go in. So they're going to hold that and then with the other hand they're going to dis, uh, disconnect the laryngoscope, the device they use to put it in. They will take a commercial restraining device. We used to use tape and just tape the heck out of it but uh, since the last probably 15 years, we've been using commercial restraining devices because they're tested and proven. Um, then they will ask you or they will do it. They will ventilate the patient and listen to the chest and the belly. What they expect to hear are sounds of air going into the lungs and nothing going into the stomach. 
once they hear that you've got that, then they're confident they're in the right place. So they may ask you to listen to the lungs and the belly. They may ask you to bag the patient while they listen to the lungs and bellies. Just whatever is necessary to make it done right. If the patient or if the paramedic hears sounds in the belly, here's where old school paramedics can trump the new kids. Leave the tube in place. There are only two holes in the back of the throat. One is the esophagus and the one is the trachea. If I hear belly sounds, it means the first one I put in is in the esophagus. So one or two minus one equals one. I can't miss a second time if I leave the first one in place. I just have to remember which one is going in the, in the lungs when I'm done. So we will put a C collar on the patient. We're going to hold everything in place. We're going to tape the crap out of them. And once it's in, we ventilate every uh, once every six seconds. So just squeeze every six seconds. Try to get it between compressions. But uh, hold the back valve mask. You remember, you're you've got a direct line into the trachea, so you lose all that dead air space in the mouth. So we can we don't have to breathe nearly as hard to get uh, ventilations. Check resistance. If it changes, tell somebody. Here's the other thing you got to be careful. If they decide to defibrillate your patient and they say clear, that means you. If you are touching the patient or any equipment that's touching the patient when they shock, it can shock you. It will stop your heart and hopefully your heart starts over again. So be careful on that one. Watch for any changes in the patient's mental status. We want to make sure that if they become more conscious, we know that so we can adjust their airway status and maybe take it out. They also, the paramedics may give drugs to knock them out longer so we can keep the airway in and maintain that airway a little bit more secure. Sometimes, not very often, they give medications to the endotracheal tube. Not the best route, but if that's the only route, that's one option we have. So if they say, ask, uh, can you remove the BVM so I can give meds, go ahead and do that. When you're intubating with trauma, you're going to still have to hold the head like we do for any other airway with trauma. They'll hold the uh, C collar in place. They'll hold the head still. Paramedic is going to be at the head, so you're going to be either across the chest or from the side trying to hold the head in place. And we'll practice that, uh, see how that goes. After the innovation, hold the tube against where the teeth is until we get it anchored in place. The teeth are a good uh, reference point, something we did learn in paramedic school in Missouri. Uh, we didn't have teeth to work with, so we just held it up at gum line. But once it's anchored in, then we're good to go. Put the C-collar, strap the head in. Anytime you move the patient, recheck the placement of the lung or placement of the tube. Make sure we're good. So keep your paramedics safe and keep checking that for them. Again, if you have any questions, write them down, bring them to class, and we'll talk about them. Always enjoy the conversation. Thanks and have a great day.